Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. This is your host, Dr. Michael McManus, and we are here today with Jamie Metzger. Jamie is the mastermind in charge of vision and planning. Uh, Jamie's mission is to clearly identify, capitalize every potential value add opportunity, weaving together long term plans that maximize returns and redefine success. Armed with a dedication to hands on assessments, Jamie seeks out opportunities that others may overlook. That's what sets Jamie apart and his ability to craft, innovate, forward-thinking plans that extend far beyond the immediate horizon. Prior to entering real estate, Jamie spent the last 20 years in the film and TV world as a camera technician, which can be described as being in the circus and military at the same time. Not only was he expected to do his highly technical job flawlessly on set, but was required to perform his duties in extreme conditions like on melting Icelandic lakes or at the bottom of a rock quarry in the middle of the night. All this to say, he turned to investing for something easier. Jamie, welcome to the show. That's a that's a great lead in. So d- tell us a little bit more about um, you know your journey into real estate and why why real estate? Sounds like you're doing some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, so I've been um, wanting to get into real estate forever. And I I had a situation, what uh, I'm sure some people can understand is called the golden handcuffs, where the work that I do is in film and television, uh, commercials. I've worked on a ton of movies, TV, you know, over a thousand commercials, probably uh, specialty projects. And it's what I've been doing since I was 13 years old. And then um, just didn't have time. Incredibly busy with that back to back to back covering people, people covering me and very fortunate. Um but just never had the time. Like I'd be reading in real uh, about real estate things and making good money, but just never had the time to uh, research it fully. And uh, I think I had the analysis paralysis, like everyone gets where I'm just like really well read up, but too nervous to take the first step. And so uh, while working in Austin uh, on a, on a TV show, um, they, we, I, we filmed season six, and then season seven was about to start and they asked me to stay for season seven. And I live in Los Angeles just to pre, you know, preface that. So um, my wife and I said, we should probably buy a house. We're going to be out here for another year. And we bought a house and that turned into be our first you know, investment property, uh, bought it. And then a year later, when we came home, we sold it, made money on it and rolled it right into another investment. And we were like, OK, it's happening. Like we're doing it. And so we started from there. Um, and just very humbly, I say now in about three years time, we've invested like crazy. We found some really wonderful mentors and we're about, we're about to close on in a couple of days on another portfolio, but we'll be about $26 million in assets under management. So yeah, we we're making up for lost time. That's awesome. So yeah. starting, what are the, do you see it? I just love digging into the background there a little bit. So coming from the film industry, what are some of the correlations that you've seen um, that are kind of the same when you're when you're dealing with real estate or what you were doing there. It's a that's a great question because so in in film my training is to always have a backup plan, always. And so what that means is like if we're shooting on a mountain, I it's my job to make sure that the cameras work properly. We're talking high end cinema cameras, and we make sure that the people that are directing or clients are getting the video of what we're shooting. And sometimes it can be really challenging and different environments. I mean, like I said, I've worked in negative 22 on a frozen Icelandic lake that was slowly sinking as we filmed there. And then I've worked in New Mexico and sandstorms and you name it. I've worked in everything around the world. Um, And so I I don't find that. I find it fun and challenging, but it's not impossible. With real estate, everything is just so much slower. And it kind of, you know, it drives me crazy. And that's my wife comes from production as well. And we just we find certain people that we work with, whether it's lenders, whether it's brokers, um, property management, and we're always very clear with people like, hey, we move quick. If you need questions from us, we get you information quick because we're super organized and we always have backup plans. And I find that um, not not everyone is the same, you know, and amongst all the different title companies and attorneys and all that, everyone works quite a bit slowly. So 
Um, that's just been a, a slight re- readjustment, but my passion for success and for having backup plans and always like, I don't let roadblocks stop me. So if someone says, Hey, I don't think you can do it. I'll find a way around it if I believe that. And that's something that's always motivated my film career. And now I'm bringing that to my real estate career. I was told for the deal that, you know, we want to talk about here, kind of told that it probably wasn't going to happen. And we just secured funding from two different sources uh, yesterday. So, <laughs> you know, oh, congratulations. Way forwards. That's, uh, that's great. Well, we'll get back to that in a minute. You know, that's interesting The when you talk about having the backup plan, because um, you know, the all there's all the different sayings out there that go with that. I think it was Patton that had one that, you know, no, no plan survives the first shot, or or Mike Tyson's great. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. Um, so when you were filming, how often did you drop a plan and everything came out just perfectly? Or was it it always kind of like, you know, you're you're coming in and and the there's there's always something getting in the way and the chart you're adjusting from the start it's yeah it's always adjusting from the start because the people at the top like the director and the cinematographer who i work directly under you know they go and scout they go look at the locations and they figure out where they want to shoot the angles all that kind of stuff and then when they show up it's raining right they didn't they didn't anticipate that or uh from a famous story from like the man of la mancha like the there were f-16s flying overhead and they couldn't record audio. And, you know, there's just the film business has nothing but curveballs. And I, I've had for the last 20 years, I haven't had a solid schedule. And I told my wife when we first started dating, I was like, it's going to be interesting dating me because I, I, there's no nine to five. Right. And so I'm really I've been trained like that, just like the military. There is a plan, but we don't know where it's going to be or what over what ridge or, you know. And so even with the best laid plans, I just have to always be prepared. I have. uh basically a sprinter fan full of backup equipment. So when I go to work, if something pops up, I have a solution that I can run to and, and solve a problem. So. So as you came into real estate, have you ever had your plan actually go where you're like, wow, that was actually the way I drew it up? No, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, we're right now we're opportunistic, right? So um, we use some of our, obviously we're use our own capital to get going. And we tried single family, we tried long-term, short-term rentals. Um, and then we found uh, a brilliant multifamily investor that got us started us on our, on our first multifamily project. And he was the one that just lit the fire under our bus and uh, our butts and showed us underwriting and working with lenders and working with property managers, you name it. And that just like empowered my wife and I, and we were just like, let's, let's start doing this. And uh, there is no one path. And I think having one path leads to, to idealism. And I think a lot of people get hung up on like, it needs to happen this way. Whereas like, I'm going to get it done no matter what. And I think getting it done is way more important about having an idea of how it should get done. Yeah. So, so, so your first, let's go back to your, that story of how you were coming into this. So you, you bought the first house cause you had to be in Austin yeah. and, and then you, you rented it after you moved. So you, you were been saying, Hey, we should get into real estate. And then you kind of got into rentals through the back door with like, oh, wait, we did it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so and we, luckily we exited the Austin market. This was like right after COVID, like right before that market just really changed. Uh huh. Yeah. But, you know, it, for us, uh, I have a good income and I work pretty consistently. So it's like I, we just take the the investment proceeds and reinvest it into other deals. Okay. So you went from that house. Did you buy another house that time or did you move on an asset class? So we bought a a short-term rental in Orlando. I did a bunch of research. I found a realtor that posted on Bigger Pockets Forum a whole bunch of reasons why you should invest in Orlando. He's been great. Unfortunately, COVID changed the dynamics of why people go to Orlando. So we're still, the the, property is doing okay. It's not doing great. Um, But, you know, we learned a ton of lessons and, and, uh, we, we learned that we don't like short-term rentals. We love self-storage. <laughs> okay. So yeah. so you went from one single family to sh- and said, well, let's do short-term. That's going to... You obviously didn't love single family. Uh, single family is fine. We still have it. It was our first house. We moved into a new house and we were like, let's try and renting it out. And it works great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then... Um, so after that, what, what happened after the short-term rental? So was it another asset class right away or... Yeah, so we went into the short-term rental because uh, you know everyone says Airbnbs just make more money, but the wear and tear is just outrageous. We have a nine-bedroom house in Orlando. 
it's themed out with a Darth Vader and and uh, you know Star Wars wall. Like all the kids love it. It has Encanto rooms and you name it, right? Um, it just doesn't rent for enough. And right now, like to give you an idea, before COVID, there was twelve flights a day from just London Heathrow to Orlando, and right now there's four, and they still haven't rebounded. So wow. it just the international travel hasn't come back to Orlando. I think it will because Disney's been there forever, and you can. It, there's just like Disney is like the anchor, right? Yeah. But you know, there's a lot of wear and tear on the property, a lot of maintenance and whatnot. We have a great property management company now. We had a terrible one that we, and and this is advice to everyone. If you have a ter- terrible property management company, rip the bandaid off, get rid of them as quick as possible. Find a new one. There's always a better one out there. Um, we waited far too long to start over, and as soon as we found a new one, they've been fantastic. So, piece of so advice did- there. Did you self-manage your single family or did you have a property manager on that one too? On our single family, we live four minutes away. It was our first house. We moved in the same neighborhood because we love the neighborhood. So we self-managed that because we knew the asset really well. You know, we we okay. had done some renovations. We knew it was good. Of course, the tenant somehow figured out how to destroy the pipes and <laughs> give us a $10,000 plumbing bill that we wouldn't have had if we still lived there. But And I guess uh, they weren't frozen pipes in Austin. No, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, you know, we did that and, you know, we're, we're trying to trim our portfolio now. And, um, you know, after that one in Orlando, we got into multifamily in California with that mentor I was telling you about. Um, just really fantastic. Uh, I, I even asked him, I said, how would I find someone like you? I was introduced to a colleague and he helped us buy our first 12 unit building and did the underwriting, helped us negotiate, got us two, two different sources of property management two different um, contractors. We did a 12 unit renovation, essentially. My wife supervised that and um, bought it for 2.2. And then it was appraised for 2.9 when we were finished. And uh, we should have sold it. That's another thing, but we decided to hold on to it for the cash flow. but the interest rates caught up with us and we're doing totally fine. But, you know, we want to, with the multifamily, we want to get into better locations, better property and better tenants. Okay. Where did you go? So, so how was that? Was self storage your next step after the multifamily, or was there something in between? Exactly. So, um, after that, we were pretty much out of our own capital. So, we had to start <laughs> saving again. And then we looked into raising capital from friends, family, you know, just typical things. And then we came across a, uh, a seller finance self storage deal uh, that enabled us to put 10% down. And uh, we have a six year note with the owner he actually just sent us a text the other day like we bought it a year ago and he said hey happy one year anniversary like he's the coolest seller uh a rare one you know it'd be amazing if all sellers were like him but yeah it was a a 10.1 million dollar acquisition that we raised capital for and and, uh closed for a million dollars down and uh, less than six months just through reducing expenses and increasing revenues where it's valued at 10 point i'm sorry 13.4 right now Oh, nice. So 30% value yeah. add already. 30% in the first year. Yeah. Wow. Well done. I love so it. I, I want to go, I want to go back kind of through, cause, cause you obviously had some people helping you along the way. So your, your mentor, you found doing the multifamily. So how did you find that mentor? It was pretty funny. In in, uh, in line at lunch one day, when I was on a film set, I turned to my friend, I said, Hey, any, anything interesting going on? And he said, yeah, I just bought a 12 unit building. And I was like, whoa, tell me everything. And then he introduced me to uh, this gentleman, Anthony, uh, that we work with. Um, Anthony's assistant is uh, the sister of the guy that I work with, right? Okay. So, yeah. And so they helped him basically sell a condo that he had and uh, roll the proceeds into another 12 unit building. They laid out the whole plan for him. And I was like, I need to go talk to this guy. We went down, my wife and I talked uh, with him and his assistant for two hours and they just gave us, I mean, I I still remember just being hit with a ton of information, but being like, we we have to do this. This is amazing. Like I've been searching for this person, this service, whatever this is, you know, for the forever. And uh, they were, you know, incredibly supportive throughout the whole process. And they check in with us like every six months to see how the property is doing. And, you know, it's a three to five year hold. So whenever we get close to that three year mark, which about be about in a year, um, they're going to get us ready to either sell it or keep holding it until the right time. So it's a really fantastic service that I don't even know how you would search for something like that. Okay. So is this a, because uh, there's a lot of different types of mentorship out there. Is this a paid mentorship or is this no. just a? 
no, the this friends was and just family. Like, thanks, buddy. It's a commission on you know, obviously us buying and selling these these properties. He's a broker as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you know, so, I think it makes a ton of sense because they're setting us up for repeat business by empowering us to do better, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's one of the interesting things is people come into this. It's like, well, if he knows how to do this, why doesn't he just do it? Is what the naysayers, because doctors tend to be very uh, cautious. I'm going to use this as a nice word um, about yeah. everybody's motivations. Um, but so, so what really he he knows how to do all this, but it sounds like that's not really what he wants to do anymore. He just he prefers to do the sales and the commissions and show you how to do it. Not necessarily though. He he owns twenty five buildings, so he he knows. Oh, he, yeah. okay. <laughs> and that was that was but, when we worked with him. He probably owns more now. But that you know, but still, for for a little bit of time, he taught you how to do it. Yep. And now he gets recurring revenue out of your work and and references. I've ref- I, like so in the film business, we you know we tend to make pretty good money. Um, and so I have a lot of friends that like, just don't know how to invest and they're terrified of investing. And I go, dude, go talk to my guy. He, and I've sent people to him and they were always appreciative. And like, you know, when you feel like you're being sold something, it, you, like my guard initially goes up, I'm sure it happens to everybody. This yep. wasn't that this was like, we can help you or or not. Right. It was like, I really appreciate that. Cause he was like, at the end of the day, we're not going to tell you to spend this money. You have to be comfortable spending it. Right. But yep. with his help, I felt totally confident doing it, and and it worked. The plan worked, so I was comfortable sending other uh, friends of mine, and I want to because I want my friends to see that, like, you know, you, you need to be working your money. Money, money sitting is like the worst thing ever. You got to go work it because it means nothing, you know. Yeah, that's great because you know I think as as and me, I don't know if it's everybody, but as doctors, we see a lot where you got used to. We went to school for a long time before we did anything. Right. So I think there's there's this this tendency to want to go learn everything. Well, I got to learn everything first because yep. that's the way medical school residency is pretty much set up. And and you talked about the analysis paralysis. So you start learning stuff and learning, and you're like, oh, I don't know enough. Oh, I don't know enough. But for a lot of people, and I remember the same thing when you when you found the right mentor and the right group of people, person or group of people, where you all of a sudden go okay, I can do this now because I have the people that when things go sideways, like you said, your contingency plan, when the plan doesn't work and you don't know what to do, you know, you have a group of people or or people you can go to with experience and say, okay, this isn't working, you know, help me find a better solution. Yep. Exactly. And, you know, they were there for us, you know, every step of the way. So, but yeah, I mean, to your point, I, I can't speak to obviously the doctors and surgeons out there. I totally get it that you guys need to practice and we appreciate that. But for me, like I I'll research as much as I can and then I have to get out there and touch it and break it and fix it. That's just how my brain works. And I remember this commercial ages ago with Kobe Bryant where they were just like, how did you get so good? And he he just kept saying the word practice over and over again. It was practice, 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 practice. And Kobe was famous for practicing all times of the day. And it just showed, right? And I'm not comparing myself by any means. I'm just saying, practice, 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 but go out there and start taking some shots. And the more practiced you are, the more research you are, yes, you'll pivot, but also try to build a network of people that when you do run into it, we run into issues all the time, but we have people or we have chat GPT, by the way, or we have um, other networks you know, online or whatever that we say, hey, we're running into this issue. And other people go, I ran into that. This is what I did. And we go, awesome. Thank you so much for that feedback. Right. So it's about building your own network too, which I, I have a massive network in film. I'm, I'm starting over with my network in real estate. Um, but you know, at some point you just got to get out there and do that because by the time you turn around, it'll be 10 years that you're you wasted and investments are all about time. You can't get that back. Yeah, no. I, and that's why I like to mention it. Cause it's, you know, for the, since we're primarily aimed at doctors on the podcast, that it's, it's one of the biggest hurdles that I've seen doctors have is they're sure. ready to go and they have a hard time pulling the trigger or they pull the trigger and the first thing doesn't go as expected. And then they just stop yep. or they're like, well, I, and a number of times I heard a doc say, oh yeah, well, I invested in real estate once and I lost my money Sure, <laughs> and, they're, and they're done. Right. And, and instead of being like, well, why did I lose my money or why did that not go well? 
how do I do it better next time? Let's go do it again. Or, you know, when, when I, yours is interesting. When, when I jumped in, I had a, a reasonable pile of cash, but I kind of spread it out and I bought some stuff myself, did some syndications because I reached that point where I'm like, I got to do something. I've, I've read the books. I've listened to the podcast. I've taken the course and, and the amount of learning because that the stuff that I spread it out across as, as we went through COVID, the end of COVID interest rates, inflation, it was pretty cool. I mean, I, yeah. most of them, one of them lost money. Some of them have gone sideways. Some have done okay, but it was like everyone taught its own little lesson. And if oh. I hadn't invested in those, I could have read those stories somewhere else, but it doesn't, it doesn't sit the same way until you worry about losing your money. Yeah, exactly. And listen, I mean, some people are just risk averse and will never take that risk. And it reminds me of like, we're in the, the Raise Masters group that Hunter Thompson runs, right? And he's got a podcast about um, the investors that you don't want to invest with. Like if I'm raising capital and I get someone that is like super nervous, ask him, it's okay. Ask me a million questions. Any deal that I am going to invest in, I know everything there is to know about it. So I can talk to you all day about it. But if somebody... Is just incredibly nervous and and whatnot. Like I, we we've the vibes need to be right, and I hate to say that as like a you know a Gen Z thing or whatever, but because I'm not Gen Z, but um you know it's if if somebody's energy is off, they're only going to get worse once they give you a check, right? Yeah. And like I need I need people to trust that what we're doing is sure we've had stuff go sideways. Like we're our 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 short term rental right now is going sideways. That's okay, right? It's going to get better, or we're going to sell it. But when we have investor money on the line, we take it even more seriously than when we have our own money, you know, on the on the line. Because for me, it's reputation, and and it's also like I I have empathy and I care for people that have worked really hard to, to invest with me. So I don't know. I, I know what you're saying, but yeah, at some point you gotta like d- divide up. You don't have to. I just keep saying you, you have to. And some people will never do it. But if you want to invest, maybe take, you know, if you have a hundred K, maybe try, you know, loaning somebody 10 grand and start to learn that process. There are groups out there. uh, We're part of another group, uh, raising private uh, capital, raising raising private money that Amy Majori runs. And some of these people are looking for 10 grand for a month. So maybe try that. And, and you know what I mean? Like, see how that goes. And loaning money is pretty easy, right? You're not doing flips, which are totally different. Um, There's all different ways to get started, but it's like, I think a lot of us are getting in this because we have other jobs and we need to invest our, our money. This, for me, this is becoming a full-time job, which I love. Um, but, uh, you know, everyone's going to make mistakes. And as my wife and I joke about it every day, there's not one single person that knows everything about the entire transaction process. And if, if, if they do, they're lying to you because every single transaction is different. Every title company to lender to, the painter, like everybody is doing something different all the time. And you just have to know where to keep your constraints. So you don't go too far off into the unknown, right? The the gentleman I was talking about earlier, Anthony, that invests in, in Long Beach, California, that's the only market he invests in. And everybody that we met from property management to, you know, construction guys, they all knew him because he had bought and sold so many properties in that, in that market. He can, he can tell you everything there is to know about that one market. He will not invest in other markets. So there is a way to like get really smart on a market and reduce your risk that way as well. So I can, you know, I offer that to people as well. Like don't invest in something 3000 miles away. If you, if you're really nervous, you know, maybe start close to home, learn it inside out and then grow from there if you want to, or don't just get really good at that one market. Or You know, you said something you backed away from it. Like, I don't want to get all Gen Z here, but (laughs) yeah, if the vibe's not right. The cool thing about that, when you talk about that, it's got to be a right match. Because one of the things that, that that I also find is kind of a doctor thing. You're so used to being sold from the, the day you graduate, you know, medical school, or even before that, you're talking to drug reps. And, and you have people come to the office trying to sell you stuff. And you have people calling you on the phone trying to sell you stuff. And you develop this sales guard. And I talk to a lot of docs and they're they're nervous about talking to people who are raising capital because they don't want a sales pitch. Right. And it's a really hard adjustment to realize like, listen, good syndicators out there are not going to give you a sales pitch. They're going to give you their pitch, but they're also going to want to know about you and find out if it's a good fit for you. Right. You know, if 
if you've never invested in anything but the stock market, there's there's not a, a reputable syndicator out there who wants you to take your life savings and plunk right. it in one of their deals because right. they don't want to know that that if this thing goes bad, you've just lost everything. Right. You know, they they want somebody who, you know, likes the risk that's of of that particular deal the way you like it, that it's acceptable and it's amount of money that's acceptable too. Right. As you talked about your short-term rental, you're like, well, it's not doing great, but if it if it'll either get better or you'll sell it, but it's not like it's not all of your net worth. Right. Yes, it was <laughs> sitting it was there in Orlando it. going, "Oh my goodness, what if this doesn't work?" Right. But again, you know, we have those thoughts, we have those bad dreams, we have those worries, but you wake up every day and you just say, "All right, I'm going to find a way to fix it." I'm a, I'm a fixer. So that's part of my nature. Right. So that, but I get some people will just be in, intimidated by that, but yeah. So if somebody's out there and they're, you know, they're frustrated with what they've been getting their, you know, their, their stock market performance, their, their, uh, financial advisor who doesn't give them any options. And they've been thinking about real estate and want to do something. And, and they were like, Jamie, you're in real estate. How should I get started in this? What should I do? I'm just, I'm so scared. I hate that question. <laughs> uh, and and listen, the reason why I'll, I'll, I'll add a story to this. So I was just working with a gentleman that is a fix and flipper, does almost 200 flips a year. And he said the worst clients or investors that he ever had were doctors because they every day were like, why are you buying those light fixtures? Why are you buying those wall plates? Like it justified this expense. And wh why are we spending so much on it? You know, X, Y, Z. And him and I were commiserating because I was like, they don't think you do this for a living. Whereas they think what they do for a living is legit, right? And I was like, would you go to the surgery room and say, hey, why are you patching up your patient like that? You know, we would never do that. And so I do think some people look at the real estate stuff as like a, it's a hobby. We put, just to give you an idea, we've spent over hundreds of hours on this current deal that we're on. Like, it's not a hobby. It's a full-time job. And we're we're available 24 hours a day because we work with people on the East Coast and West Coast. So my day starts at 7 a.m. I was already on a call at 7 a.m. And my day will end at 9 p.m. And those are shorter hours than what I'm doing on film. So I don't mind it. <laughs> and I get to work from home. But, uh, you know, I do think getting started in real estate is such a difficult question because there are so many different ways from lending money to buying assets to, to putting money in a syndication deal. Um to be a you know transaction coordinator, there's so many different ways to make money on it. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to get my real estate license. That's not being in real estate. We don't have a real estate license. We have zero interest in that. Um, it, it, it also depends on how much you want to manage, right? So like we have property management at all our properties, except for the one that is four minutes away from us. Um, but once you have the right team in there, they're doing what they're supposed to do and you get monthly updates. You know, um, it, it, it just depends on time, effort, and capital. And I think you really have to be uh, honest with yourself about pick two, right? Because you can't have all three. And so pick the two that you're like, okay, I can do this and this, but I don't want to invest a ton of time into it. Okay. Well then find something that can be managed by someone else. Right. And so um, I think that's what I would say. I mean, like it, it's so hard to, we thought we got started in sell, um, uh, single family homes, right? We're like, okay, that's what we're going to do. We've changed and changed and changed and changed. And now we love self-storage. That's what we absolutely love. And people are like, why would you leave multifamily? Um, I recently just met a gentleman that owns a company with billions of dollars of assets under management. He told me they haven't bought a deal in three years. All they do is multifamily, right? And we know why. It's because of the interest rates. Like the deal, like people sellers have not reduced their prices to make deals work with um the interest rate market that we have right now, right? And so yeah. we're still buying self-storage deals because we're doing them creatively with seller finance or subject to, uh, or raising capital and just getting them for the right price. That's awesome. Yeah. And the other, you know, and I've had, I've talked to a few docs and I'm like, well, I've got a hundred thousand dollars, but all these deals require a hundred thousand dollars. I was like, well, find 10 friends, you're right. a doctor, you're in a hospital, put your, each of you put a hundred thousand dollars in and then go buy a hundred thousand dollars in 10 different deals. And now you've, now you've, you know, if what you're looking is that you're worried about one deal going bad, right. you've spread it across 10 deals. And, you know, so there's different ways to, to change your risk or change your exposure. And, 
Sure. And sometimes it's finding a friend and and working together. So I guess I'm always curious for the for the like your friends on on your side of it. How do you go about finding the right, I guess, syndicator or group to work with? And how do you vet them? For me, um, you know, it's interesting because because most I would say of all the docs I've talked to about investing in real estate, nine out of ten have interest, one out of ten will actually do it. Exactly. Right. Um, and and of that one out of ten, uh, at least half of them will do one deal and stop because they got nervous and and they never really see it through and they and they don't spread it out. So um when I started, I I started, I started investing. I well, I did my first. You know, I started up years ago, and it was kind of house hack. I bought my first place. I finished the basement, and you know, got roommates, and was like, that was pretty cool, and sold it for a lot more than I, I bought it for. And then we kind of had a deal where we moved, like yours, but our first renter was horrible, <laughs> and had to be evicted, and was driving you know eight hours down to where it was to meet with the sheriff, and like he he was a professional squatter, so it was it was it was a process. And then we quit, although I wanted to do real estate. We quit for about ten years until I decided to get back in and bought a fourplex and kind of self managed it because I wanted to learn about how that worked. Smart, Looking yeah. back. I would say, you know, if you're really looking to scale, I mean, knowing a little bit about a good property management company might help. I, I would rather just find a good property management company. If you don't like them, find another one and find another one and not spend your time doing something else besides answering phone calls that they see a lot of wasps flying around, Right. which is when we recently got, you're like, really? You, yeah. you know, <laughs> I have, you so, know, so a lot of uh, something that always comes up when people are like, well, I feel like I want to buy my first deal, like in my neighborhood or somewhere close to close by. I own a house four minutes away from where I live and we'll be driving by it. And I'll be like, I'll ask my wife, cause we have to go like one block in. I go, do you want to go drive by the house? She goes, what's changed? I go, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Just maybe to put eyes on it. I, I don't know. I guess we're doing it to say that we do, but I own stuff that's 3000 miles away too. I don't drive by it. We get yep. pictures, we get updates, we get reports like, it's all being managed. And if the house burns down, we'll get a phone call about that and we'll take care of it. Right. Like I think people just find all certain, all, all different ways to put roadblocks in front of themselves. And I'm, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm like, if I'm putting a roadblock in front of myself, I, I kind of take a, a step back and say, how do I get around this? Because if I believe in it, we're going to get it done. If, it, yep. if it's not a good deal, we'll pivot. We'll walk away. We, we walked away from something in April that was really difficult to do, but we had to right? for our investors. We're like, this does not make sense. And, yeah, uh, you know, I know. And, and even I had this idea like, well, maybe I want to scale up and build my own property management company. And now I'll know how to do it. <laughs> and uh, I'd use that justification talking to Joe Fairless. And uh, and he was like, why would you do that? Then yeah. if you want your own property management company, partner or hire somebody who already knows how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, so like every I, I really think that's one where unless you're really like that property management thing, like letting a professional do it but yeah yeah you know, then i moved that's how, where i said okay i can't scale this and i and i started looking towards syndications and i just I, my initial syndications i looked for the ones with the lowest minimum i could find because i just wanted to spread it out sure which was an interesting thing but it got me started to where i learned enough about the process that i felt i understood the whole process and i saw some risk and then was ready to do more myself again. So I I had to de-risk. So I so I de-risked. And uh now some of those I still have dangling and my accountant is like, dude, you have more K1s. Right. Like, yeah. How much did you he thought, you know, he's like, he's looking, he's like, why were you putting 20 grand in one deal and you got a pile of them? I'm like, I wanted to spread it out. It's yeah. like, oh my goodness. So but in the beginning, that's what made me comfortable because I was going forward one way or the other. And that was kind of the the difference there. So I found my way around that hundred thousand dollar minimum and you know, and, and got the experience to feel comfortable that I I knew enough, I knew the questions to ask, I could move forward. Yeah. It I mean, like, listen, like you're not gonna just start operating on patients without doing some research and some schooling, right? Like it's the same thing. I, and, you know, when I was saying earlier, don't just jump in without any knowledge, definitely do some research. But we live in an amazing time in human history where 
I use chat GPT on a daily basis, but I also verify those answers against humans and other research. It, it's impossible. Like we live in such an amazing time that anything can be figured out. Anything can be learned. Anything can be, you know, it's it just for people to, to, to sit on the sidelines. I can't help them. I, I don't have time. But if somebody wants to invest with me, you know, and wants to ask questions, absolutely. Let's talk about it all day long. And to your point, you know, the the high uh, income earners, doctors, lawyers, you know, you name it, like you guys need tax benefits, right? So like a huge thing that we do is cost segregation studies and we pass on, you know, an equal amount of investment. Let's say you're into a deal for 1% of the syndicated thing, right? You're going to get the tax benefits equal to that. And so a lot of people look for just tax investment benefits over the returns. Well, for everybody out there listening, and and this has been a great lead in, I want to get into what Jamie's doing now in self-storage. So we're going to wrap up this first half of the show here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And please join us for the second half of this interview with Jamie Metzger. And we're going to deep dive into self-storage when we come back. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional, and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.